people have some different opinions, and we'll leave plenty of time for you folks to raise questions, uh, push, push us uh, any way you want to develop, uh, develop our thinking and to explore ideas, it, particularly tonight because the, the panel has a question mark at it, what should Obama do in response to the developments uh, in Iraq and Syria and the rise of ISIS. So we'll hear some views, but we don't claim to have the answer to that question. It's more to trigger a discussion, which I think our society very much requires. I suspect most of you know that uh, the, the conflict was escalated today quite significantly. The US and some allies conducted airstrikes and cruise missile strikes on targets in Syria for the first time. So the war has clearly widened in a very significant way and President Obama says that this is just the beginning. So we're really in a whole new ball game as of today, a much wider war with much deeper US involvement. And that's what we will investigate. Uh, so the way we will do this is uh, first Ronald Tierski, who's a professor in the political science department here at Amherst College, will talk about ISIS, what we need to understand about ISIS and what kind of a threat it poses as a way of framing the discussion of what Obama should do. And then Professor Anthony Ferraro on the <coughs> left, who teaches international relations at Mount Holyoke College and the University of Massachusetts will take up more of the question of what Obama, what the United States should or should not do. Um, and um, I might make some additional comments if it seems appropriate, but I'm gonna try to limit this formal part uh, for, you know, have eat, 20 minutes, about okay? 25 minutes, yeah, uh, 20 minutes each, uh, so that there'll be plenty of time for all of you to get engaged in this conversation. Um, and I think that's all that I have to announce right now. Do you think of anything else? No. Nope. So, uh, Ron Tierski will begin talking about ISIS. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. It works. Uh, all right. Well, it's great you know, to be on a panel with my uh, friend and colleague, Vinnie Corral, and my friend and colleague, Michael Clare. Uh, where I would like to do Closer. So what I'd like to do is uh, talk about ISIS uh, in particular. I may have a thing or two to say about uh, what Obama should do or maybe what's happening anyway, uh, but my thoughts about that will come out in the question period, maybe in reaction to something. Is the microphone turned on? I'm not sure. Pardon me? Is it turned on, the microphone? Yeah, you, I right. think you have to bring it close. Okay, sorry. is that better? Yes. All right, I'm, you know, I'm glad to oblige. Now, I'm writing a little piece on this, and um, so if you'll permit me, I'm going to more or less uh, read it with interpolations. Um, uh, it's more concise than what I might um, you know, improvise. So here's, here, here is how I would uh, analyze ISIS and its, and its uh, policy. In international relations in general, every government's foreign policy in any geopolitical relationship is made with respect to every other government's foreign policy. In a crisis situation, this uh, interpenetration, this action-reaction of uh, foreign policies is especially evident. Uh, any government has to calculate what other governments are doing as part of deciding yourself what to do. And this is part of what uh, President Obama has to think about. He's not just making foreign policy. He makes his policy in relation to what other governments are doing in a particular situation, in a particular context, and with respect to what's going on elsewhere in the world at the same time. For example, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Now, um, it seems to me that in almost all the American media commentary uh, about uh, what uh, the United States should do, what Obama's foreign policy should be, 
the emphasis is on Obama himself and on the United States. I think this is uh, inadequate and uh, it requires a larger view. So what I'd like to do is to talk about what is surprisingly little analyzing the problem. That is, let's start with this. What is the foreign policy of ISIS? ISIS has a foreign policy. It's not just there with a lot of guns shooting in every direction. ISIS has a foreign policy that has a strategy, uh, which some of you may know, some of you may not know, and it has a goal, which is not simply to defend the territory that it's all already uh, seized. So first I'd like to say a few words about ISIS itself. What is ISIS? What is the so-called Islamic State? We could say that ISIS is four things at the same time. It has four faces. First, ISIS is a political movement, a geopolitical movement, that claims to be based in religious motives and religious principles. I have no doubt that many of, ISIS, of the ISIS fighters, perhaps most of them who could say, are really believers, that they believe in the mission of ISIS and the Islamic State as defined by the leadership. And you find documents, I don't know if you've gone online and Googled ISIS and Googled the Khalifa uh, plans, you find um, enough to, uh, to make you think. Uh, so that's the first thing, a political, geopolitical movement that claims to be based on religious motives. Second, ISIS is a terrorist operation which uses uh, terrorist actions, terrorism as a tactic to achieve certain ends. ISIS is an organization that kills uh, and maims and blows things up. That is part of its nature. The third uh, thing uh, that ISIS is, I think, is uh, an unexpectedly well-organized and combat-ready military. Everybody was surprised at the uh, ease with which uh, ISIS seized all this territory, took over Mosul, uh, and you know, carved out this this little empire. Uh, afterwards, after it took Mosul. Uh, there was a report, maybe it was in the Wall Street Journal or the Times, I don't know, that ISIS was holding Mosul with 500 fighters, more or less. This is a city of what, a million and a half people? ISIS was holding it with 500 um, fighters. The fourth face of ISIS is that it's also a kind of international crime syndicate. Uh, ISIS. Um, kidnaps people, um, tries to ransom them. Uh, ISIS uh, uh, takes over oil production uh, wells and sells the oil uh, uh, in, on the black market, sometimes to people that it's against, for example, the, the uh, Syrian government. So ISIS is a, is a kind of uh, crime syndicate as well. Let's go back. ISIS political goal. Uh, it's geopolitical goal. We know that. ISIS wants to create an international Islamic caliphate such as existed from the year 632 AD, which the first one was called the Rashidun Caliphate, organized by Muhammad's immediate successors. So the caliphate uh, existed from the time of Muhammad. The principles and organization of the caliphate, which exists now because uh, it's been proclaimed and ISIS controls the territory. The principles and organization, the constitution of the caliphate, are based on ISIS version of the Quran and of Sharia law, which is very particular, very uh, sectarian, very brutal. ISIS version of Sharia is a supposedly pure Islam in relation to which not only all other religions are disqualified, but in which every other sect of the Muslim world community 
is heretical, infidel. The Shia of Iran, for example, are filthy infidels in ISIS language. Furthermore, ISIS believes that even other jihadist groups are infidel, an example being Al-Qaeda, the other jihadi groups fighting in Syria as well. Now, let's compare uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. ISIS is different from Al-Qaeda in its strategy and in its goal. ISIS is more like the Taliban in the sense that uh, it's not, it's not, ISIS is not simply a more extreme, more brutal version of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is an international terrorist organization whose actions are designed to be an agent provocateur that incites backlash by the target states. Al-Qaeda's goal is to commit terrorist actions that will lure, in particular, the United States into wars that would lead the American economy in particular. This would weaken American morale, thus American ambitions for uh, world leadership and American uh, alliances around the world. 9-11 is the most important example of this uh, strategy of the agent provocateur, and to my mind, 9-11 turned out to be a great victory for Al-Qaeda. Uh, they didn't care if they got killed because of it, what they cared about was the effect that it uh, achieved. And it was a tremendous effect. It's, the United States has, has poured so many lives and so much money uh, into the uh, war on terror because of 9-11. By contrast with Al-Qaeda, ISIS is more like the Taliban in that ISIS wants to seize territory from existing states, Iraq, Syria, and then turn this territory into a new kind of state, a Muslim caliphate, that claims, the caliphate claims authority over the entire Muslim world. We all saw on television uh, the, um, uh, you know, the video of uh, Caliph Ibrahim's speech, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's speech in the mosque in Mosul where he dressed in black proclaimed the, the caliphate and, and uh, called on all Muslims to uh, accept uh, his authority. Beyond this, I'd make a couple of points. Certainly, as I said, ISIS is to some extent a movement that is genuinely based in religious belief. I have no problem with that. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, Caliph Ibrahim, on an internet jihadist biography of him is said to have a BA, an MA, and a PhD in Islamic studies from the Islamic University of Baghdad. Now, I'm sure that, that uh, al-Baghdadi is a complicated character, uh, but he, does, he has a, a uh, let's call it an academic international uh, foundation in, um, in uh, in Islamic studies and in Sharia uh, law. We need to make sense of ISIS in terms other than the simple terms, the simplistic terms uh, given to us by, for example, uh, President Obama. Obama calls ISIS a cancer. Well, this is a metaphor, and it's, a, it's not a good metaphor. Uh, Cancer is you know, physical disease. We understand what he means. Uh, ISIS is a tumor that could metastasize. What I would say is this. ISIS, in my mind, is a new form of fascism. Let's call it fascism with a religious face. We know what fascism is. We might talk about what the uh, exact definition is, but we, we know what fascism is was. ISIS is a form of fascism. In this sense, I would say Nazism was a fascist movement with a nationalist face, and Stalinism was fascism with a socialist communist face. Anybody that wants to talk about that, um, you know, that might be controversial to define Stalinist communism as fascism with a socialist communist face. It's not essential, but somebody might want to talk about it.
ISIS fighters, therefore, can be genuinely religious fighters who commit barbarous crimes in the service of what they think are the Quran's true commandments and uh, Allah's will, just as the Nazis were true believers who committed abominable crimes in the service of Nazi ideology. Same was true of communist Stalin's true believers. Uh, I would say, to conclude about this aspect of ISIS, for many of the ISIS fighters, it is also a great adventure. It's a kind of thrill. It's a lyrical period in their lives where they are participating something in something that is extraordinary to them and lifting them out of the uh, lives that uh, they were leading before. Uh, let us not think that beheadings are designed only to terrorize and to agonize the outside world. The beheadings are also designed as a thrilling experience for those who do them and those who might like to do them. We all saw the video of the London accented execu execution of um, Jihad Johnny, the fearsome decapitator dressed in a kind of Lawrence of Arabia outfit, brandishing a knife and wagging his finger at the President of the United States. But let us ask ourselves, who is Johnny Jihad? Where was he a few years ago? When did he get hooked up with ISIS? Maybe a few years ago, this character was a dead-end gangbanger in some bad London neighborhood with no job prospects, full of frustration and resentment at a world that gave him little possibility of a successful life. Maybe this fellow was incensed at the centuries of stagnation of Muslim societies and the humiliation by the West of Islamic governments through the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Indian Ocean. I think it would be a mistake not to understand this aspect of a great adventure that's so attractive to so many uh, young, overwhelmingly male um, uh, fighters. Finally, and this will, will be my last point, what is the ISIS plan? Uh, if you look on the internet, if you type in uh, uh, ISIS five-year plan, there's a five-year plan that was published. You can find it uh, on the uh, website of, of a magazine called Dabiq, D-A-B-I-Q, which is the ISIS publication now. It's come out in two issues. And you find this map, which shows what uh, the caliphate is supposed to be in five years. It, it is to encompass um, Iraq, Syria, Kurdistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Maghreb, uh, Morocco, and uh, Libya and Algeria, uh, Central Africa, uh, Iran, uh, Spain, where Islam ruled for seven centuries, uh, Eastern Europe, parts of Eastern uh, Europe. And it's you know, amazing. Uh, ambition. Spain is going to be taken in the year 2020, according to them. Uh, there is even an order of conquest. And if you're permitting, I'm going to read from uh, several uh, lines which gives you a sense of what ISIS is about. In the current stage, ISIS is concentrating on consolidating its rule in the parts of Iraq and Syria it has already conquered, and on expanding its rule in these countries, beginning with areas where there is a Sunni majority. The next stage will be conquering the bordering Muslim states. The second issue of this magazine, Dabiq, uh, cites a hadith of the Prophet that precisely defines the organization's order of priorities following the establishment of the state. First, Saudi Arabia then Iran, and ultimately what they call Rome, which means Christendom. What? So the first stage involves expanding the caliphate to take over Sunni Muslim countries, which means that the struggle against 
the West is put off. And al-Baghdadi said specifically he's not trying to attack the United States. The first stage of Muslims around the world is the duty of hijra, that is migration to the Islamic Caliphate state. Uh, you remember in Baghdadi's speech, he called on physicians and lawyers and professional people to come to the Caliphate. It's an amazing uh, performance. So, uh, Islamic State, ISIS, has, has a, uh, a goal, a geopolitical goal, which is to reoccupy and take back the lands that Islam uh, once uh, ruled. What this does is to put ISIS directly in the path of it makes ISIS directly a threat to all the countries it plans to take over. In terms of ISIS foreign policy, they have created a perfect storm for themselves because they're threatening every possible country around them. The idea of a coalition against ISIS, no matter how hard it is to put together, makes perfect sense in principle because all Muslim countries through Central Asia are threatened by, um, by ISIS. Uh, and so you might ask yourself, why does ISIS put itself in this position of threatening everybody? And that's an interesting question to which you know, I don't know the exact answer. One would, one would have to uh, know something about uh, Baghdadi psychology and those around him. But these are just a few beginning uh, points uh, uh, putting ISIS in a larger context, talking about what it is, uh, what it, uh, what, how we can understand it in terms that we can understand so we don't have to um, remain with uh, um, diluted, simplistic metaphors. For example, uh, Obama's idea calling it a cancer. So I, you know, that's what I have to say um, to start with about ISIS and uh, Professor Ferraro to go on. Before Finney takes over, let me just ask you one question, if I may. What do you think are its capacities, its capabilities to carry out its plan? It's not going to carry out that plan. That's obvious. And the, the attacks and ISIS in Syria today show that. This, this thing has to be stopped, in my opinion. This thing has to be stopped, and it's going to be stopped. Uh, you cannot expect Turkey, for example, to allow this uh, state, uh, this terrorist barbaric state, to continue to exist. It's going to threaten Turkey. Um, Iraq. Iraq is a country that's gone through so much. The Iraqi people have gone through so much. Um, uh, they will do something. They will get together. It will be difficult. It won't be perfect. In particular, the Kurds, the Peshmerga, are going to get together. The Saudis are already involved. Uh, they are uh, accepting a training base for uh, fighters against, uh, against the Islamic State on their territory. Um, France and, you know, started to bomb already. So if you want my view at the end, ISIS, according to recent estimates, has perhaps 50,000 fighters. Uh, 21,000 in uh, Syria and 30,000 more or less in Iraq. 15,000 of them are foreign fighters. A lot of those foreign fighters showed up after this thing began. Now, everybody knows how difficult it is to incorporate people into a fighting force. My suspicion is that ISIS is more fragile than it looks. And everything is there, um, this, this implicit um, uh, self-interest of coalition of, of outside countries is there such that I, I think that after enough ISIS fighters start getting killed, 
it's going to start to disintegrate. Um, their fighters are going to say, well, you know what? This is not such a great idea. I think that there will be revenge killings for the executions of Syrian soldiers and Iraqi soldiers. There might be some beheadings. It's, it's going to be very bloody. To my mind, the only issue is how long it will take and how much blood will be spilled along the way. Kennan, George Kennan analysis, those were movements that had to expand. They couldn't, they couldn't just be static. They had to expand. If ISIS can't expand, will that, will that, be, will that trigger the disintegrate? It does, must it expand in order to flourish? Or can it flourish in theory in the area it currently holds? This is an interesting point in the way of a comparison. I don't want to push the comparison with Nazism and communism too far. But the, the ISIS strategy is you establish the caliphate as it's been established in parts of Iraq and Syria. And the first problem is to defend the caliphate. Where ISIS differs from Al-Qaeda here is that Al-Qaeda didn't want to seize territory. Al-Qaeda is an international terrorist organization that wants to provoke, through its actions like 9-11, uprisings, transformations in other countries. ISIS begins with its caliphate such as it exists, and I agree with you completely, ISIS needs to expand, or else people will get disappointed. All right. It's like to go on with my, and now it's not, to go on with my comparison, in the history of the international communist movement, all of us who remember that. The, the argument between Trotsky and Stalin in the 1920s. Trotsky wanted permanent revolution throughout the world. Stalin said, no, first socialism in one country. ISIS is saying socialism in one country. And Al-Qaeda is Trotsky, in effect. So uh, the Soviet Union survived. I don't think the, I don't think the Islamic State is going to survive. Okay, thank you. Yes.